Greetings, fellow recording nerds. So over the last few Mondays, I've been doing a series called How to Not Completely F*** Up Your Home Recordings. And we've done a basic guide, plus an episode on how to record those rampaging megalomaniacs, the vocalists. So for today, I thought it'd be fun to do an episode dedicated to those uh, musicians who keep your musical dreams grounded. Yeah, that's the word we're looking for. These guys make sure when things start going right, they make it go wrong. You know what I'm talking about. The exterminators of entertainment, the floggers of fidelity, the destroyers of distinction. That's right. This is 15 things to avoid while recording bass. Bass players have destroyed more perfectly good records than I care to remember. Far too often, I've had a great project come in here where everything is going great until the bass player plugged in and then just full diary all over the music. It takes about three seconds in the studio to figure out who didn't bother learning their parts and about 90% of the time, it's because somebody got the genius idea to put the shitty guitar player on the bass. After all, it's only four strings, right? Number one, you underestimated the instrument. Four strings that are a lot thicker than guitar strings. This means that bass is a much more physical instrument than the guitar, because it takes more power to get the strings moving, especially if you want the bass to be played in a way where it's heard with attack and distinction. Look, if you play the bass like a normal guitar, it's going to sound weak. Nut up, wind up, and put some power into those fucking strings. Number two, you don't need an expensive bass. Now, most bass players are going to rejoice at this little fact. You don't need an expensive bass to get great tone. One of my favorite basses to record ever is a cheap made in Mexico Fender Jazz that I picked up on the local classifieds for a whopping 200 Canadian dollars. Of course, it came with a terrible setup and was filthy, but after some adjustments, it became one of my favorite recording basses. Yeah, it is absolutely amazing what you can find for 200 bucks. Now, I've had clients come in with far more expensive Made in America jazz basses and ask if they could trade guitars. <gasps> nope, not happening. The only thing I've ever upgraded on this bass are the pickups. My friend from Detroit sent me some experimental ones and they're pretty cool, but honestly, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. I personally really like the sound of the jazz basses, especially in metal, as they have a nice mid-range grind that is very easy to work with. Hell, even a cheap Squire jazz will probably do the trick. Overall, when it comes to bass guitar, it's not the expense of the instrument that's what's important. If it stays in tune and doesn't pick up a lot of noise, it will do the job. There are far more critical points to worry about. Number three, get a good cable. It's not glamorous, but it's absolutely critical to making a good recording. If you're struggling with your cable shorting out, it's going to add a whole bunch of wasted time into the process. For example, if your cable's doing this, then it's time to break down and buy a new one. A quality cable can last you years and is well worth the investment. It'll save you endless hours of frustration while recording. Because with a good cable, you can truly hear just how awful your playing is and that you need to practice without all the nasty crackling and signal dropouts. Seriously, the last thing you want to happen is to be in the middle of a take or you're nailing the part and just have the sound stop because of a bad cable. This will kill your vibe and ruin the session. Let's be honest here, your bass playing is already terrible. Why make it worse? Number four, new strings, you cheap fuck. Other than a naked woman that isn't a family member, let me show you something that most bass players have never seen before. These are called new bass strings and cost a whopping $16.69 over at Sweetwater. That's right, the thing your bassist is too cheap to buy really isn't that expensive. But the bass strings sound warmer. Shut the fuck up! Look, we're trying to get the bass to work in the context of a mix, not all by itself. And in metal, that means presence and attack. The single easiest way to improve your bass tone is to put on new fucking strings. But James Jamerson said he preferred old strings. Oh, how many times I've heard that utter gem of wisdom come out of the bass community. Okay, let me ask you intellectual giants a very simple question. 
Did James Jamerson play on Rain and Blood? Or Vulgar Display of Power? How about Chaos AD? No! That's because James Jamerson didn't play on metal records. He played on Motown! Hell, James Jamerson didn't even play on Slippery when wet. Now, while most recording advice works across the musical spectrum, some is a little more genre specific. And when recording your bass at home, if you're playing anything slightly heavier than Motown, go buy some new fucking strings! And for all you bass players out there trying to provide helpful advice, please go back to the pasture and resume chewing grass. Leave the scholarly pursuits to those of us equipped for the job. Number five, don't track in four second increments, play inspired. Now, if you can't track your bass line longer than four bars at a time, you've got no business recording it. That is the indisputable indicator that you didn't fucking practice. Seen this happen so many times in here. Band's ticking along, everything is going great, and then we plug in the bass. <laughs> and play a few seconds, mistake, stop, punch in the next part. Play a few seconds, mistake, stop, punch in the next part. This is not an inspired performance. This is doing the bare minimum. And this is the part where I usually throw the bass player out of the studio. Stop wasting my time, go home and learn your fucking shit. But if you're tracking at home with the intention of bringing your stuff to a studio to be mixed, ask yourself, are you nailing your tracks or are you floundering? Because it will affect the overall sound of the record. Bass guitar is absolutely critical to heavy guitar tone. If your bass is not locked in properly with what the guitars are doing, you're only getting half the picture. bass is played weekly, the whole mix suffers. You have to deliver the goods in terms of your performance. If you put in the least amount of effort, the record will sound like it. Remember, you're trying to sell a product to an audience that really doesn't buy music anymore. Not the traditional sense, anyway. If you're wondering why nobody's buying your music, ask yourself this. Did you actually put forth an effort, or did you just phone it in? Number six, direct or mic'd or both. I don't care if you mic up an amp or go through something like a dark glass pedal, what the person mixing your record needs more than anything is a direct signal off your bass. That way we can manipulate the sound any way we want. We can reamp, we can send it through amp sims, we can put it through pedals, the options are there. Look, even if you know what you're doing, and believe me, after working with basses for over two decades, most of you certainly don't, Please don't be a whiny bitch about these things. Just give us a fucking direct signal. Use one of these, a direct box, to split the signal and run your bass through whatever the fuck you like. That's absolutely fine. Just give us a fucking direct signal like we asked. And no, it's not some sound guy conspiracy to fuck with your tone. Yeah, your precious tone that's so important to you, you couldn't be bothered to put new fucking strings on your bass. Yeah, we really want to mess that up. Let me spell it out for you in terms so simple that you'll finally understand it once you finally learn to stop drooling all over yourself. Mix engineers are trying to get the best sound possible for you. Please don't fuck with the process because you're not helping. Number seven, file format. Please record at 24 bit, 48 kilohertz, unless instructed otherwise by your mix engineer. Now, if you don't know what that is, ask your guitar player because he already knows everything anyway. Number eight, pick your finger style. I don't care, just stop palm muting. The easiest way to tell if you're dealing with an actual bass player or just another shitty guitar player, if there are palm mutes on the bass. To be absolutely crystal clear to you four string troglodytes, palm mutes on the bass sound like shit. Just stop fucking doing it. You're not adding anything to the dynamics of the song, you're just making the overall record sound worse. Now look, I don't care if you use pick or finger style. As long as it's in time and in tune and it's not palm muted, that's what's really important here. 
The debate on whether or not to use a pick on a bass is overblown, pointless, and is only repeated by bass players who are deluded enough to think that their opinion actually means something. Here's a hint, guys. It doesn't. Number nine, watch for open strings. Bass strings have a lot of mass, and when you get one moving, the other ones start to move as well, even if you don't touch them. Now, this is a phenomenon called sympathetic vibration, and it really and truly does sound like shit. Any bass player worth more than used gum stuck to the bottom of a shoe understands this idea, that the strings not being played need to be controlled as well. Unfortunately, most bass players I've worked with really don't have any idea about this because they've never bothered to buy a decent bass amp, so it's not like anybody could actually hear them at band practice anyway. Number 10, retune after every take. If your bass isn't in tune, there is no point in recording. Use a clip-on tuner, use a software tuner, I don't care. Just make sure your instrument is in tune and keep it in tune. Last thing you wanna do is to have to throw your tracks out because of bad tuning. Yes, it might be possible to fix it with Melodyne, but that takes time and you really wanna burn up your mix budget fixing something that should have been done properly to begin with. Number 11, give us a flat sound. A lot of basses have really nice three band EQs on them. My Dingwall has that and it sounds very nice. However, I always record with this off because we're trying to get a balanced sound and these can make certain notes jump out of the mix really badly. You're playing along, everything sounds great and then it's like, the fuck was that? Now, for those of you guys who already know everything and saying, fuck you, Glenn, you can't tell me what to do. Well, here's some more useful advice. If you're going to ignore basic knowledge and insist on using your onboard active EQ, then at the very least, leave it set consistently from take to take. Don't do half the song and then change the EQ or change the EQ for every different part of the song. Not if you want to get your mix done in a timely fashion and at a reasonable price because your mix engineer will burn up studio time and your budget trying to fix that shit. If you have a part that absolutely must stand out from the rest of your bass parts, then put it on its own separate track so it can be treated specifically. Don't put it on your main track because it's going to be just a total fucking nightmare to deal with. Number 12, watch for noise. Now I've noticed this on a lot of bass guitars, they can pick up nasty noise if you're not touching anything metal on them. So it's important that you touch your bass at all times when recording, even if it's at the end of the song and has a long sustaining open string. Keep a finger on the bridge or something like that to keep the noise under control. Yes, this can be fixed in software in post, but I'm sure your mix engineer would rather spend his time getting an amazing mix instead of fixing careless bullshit. Number 13, low chords don't work and neither do low note harmonies. I had a band come in a few years back and the guitar player had written out all the bass parts on Guitar Pro. The only problem was he tried doing low note harmonies underneath the guitar chords and those sounded like shit. Simply put, harmonies stop working below a certain frequency range. What sounds great two octaves up falls to pieces in the lower registers. This phenomenon is called a lower interval limit. Adam Neely's got a good video on this. Now a simple solution to all this, stop trying to be clever and actually listen to your ideas before bringing them into the studio. Well, it worked on Guitar Pro. <laughs> yes, but in here, it sounds like shit. Now go home and rewrite your bass lines, Mozart. I've got better things to do than watch you fuck your way up through this shit. Number 14, export a dry track along with your effects track. Yes, I know, I already covered the DI part, but I just want to be extra special clear. If you want to include your pedal track or your amp track along with your dry track, that is absolutely fine. As far as your bass tracks are concerned, the more options we have for mixing, the better. But don't give me 35 alternate takes. One nicely edited or comped master take is perfectly fine. I can blend your two or three tracks together at mix time and even take the direct signal and reamp it as I've probably got way better gear in here for recording bass than you will ever have. Let's not mince words here. The reality is I spent my money on gear. You spent your money on drugs. 
Number 15, give the bass to your guitar player. Because we all know you'd rather spend your day on Pornhub instead of actually working. This saves you time, it saves us grief, and will ultimately make your record better.